All right, thanks for having us. We're excited to chat with you about unique pitfalls of leveraging query federation over lake house within the DoD. This is us. Uh, we're uh, this is us. We're just two guys uh, who love data. We've been drinking, digging into Trino for quite a while now, so happy to share our learnings with you all today. A quick snapshot of who Raft is, what we do. We simply connect humans with data for solving national security data challenges. Some of the logos here represent some of our customers, and as a company, we do three things, uh, and core of which our data, and that's what sort of what we'll, we'll be talking about today, which is Raft Data Platform. So here's our high-level agenda of the talk today. Uh, we're going to focus on how we do open policy agent um, and how we build an open policy agent uh, engine for Trino, and how we went about implementing that as data as policy for Trino. And we made sure to include uh, time at the end for a demo, uh, since most talks with demos are better. So we'll make sure that we leave time at the end for demos. So I'm sure most folks are familiar with Lakehouse architecture and what it enables us. But at a high level, a high level overview, Lakehouse architecture combines the storage flexibility of data lakes with query performance of data warehouse in a unified platform, which enables scalable and efficient data analytics with schema on read and asset transaction support. But although that's easier said than done, there are unique challenges of implementing this architecture within the DoD. And some of those challenges entail there's several hundred data formats, and some of those data formats could be XML. They require querying on XML using XPath. Uh, they also require changing data formats on the fly, both streaming or batch, from legacy data formats over to the new data formats. The security requirements are on data aren't just that who needs to see what, but it also includes who needs to see what within a data, pay, data payload in terms of data level filtering and tag level filtering. And it also sometimes uh, include who can see what at what given time. So the roles and attributes of the users at any given time can change, and we have to be able to cognizantly incorporate that within our data security. And as with any lakehouse architecture, the need to do both structured and unstructured data is there. Uh, however, you know that uh, that that is made even more complex because now uh, not only do you have unstructured and structured data, but you ha also have data sitting in uh, what we call data silos, like SharePoint or Confluence, where the users are actively changing the documents, but those documents and that intel might not be coming into your data lake. And with the invent of you know LLMs, that's much more uh, needed now with uh, you can have a rag and a vector store if that information isn't coming into your data lake that information is basically not being leveraged to be able to make decisions and lack of data tagging so all this data uh, that sits in disparate environments is not tagged well which of course means that for us to be able to do data lineage and either visually represent data lineage or query data lineage is just not possible because data that's not tagged well can't be shown as a lineage. And last but not least, you know, technology problems aside, it, it, it has to be a cultural change uh, within a large organization like DOD. Uh, some are adopting the lakehouse architecture and the modern ways of uh, embracing uh, the warehouse and the lakehouse architecture, but the cultural change is always needed to be able to do that at a large scale like DOD. So RAF's data platform is meant to solve some of those needs, some of those pain points. We, we don't claim that we're solving everything, but we're uh, solving some of these pain points that pertain around data, tagging, and security. At a fundamental platform level, we implemented data platform, uh, RAF data platform to be able to implement architectures like data fabric, as well as architectures like data mesh, because both will need a core platform on which data domain teams or data teams work out of. So at a foundational level, the platform enables creation of a data products, uh, as well as connecting to other data platforms using SQL or APIs, which is an implementation detail for data mesh or data fabric. We've made it cloud native so that you can spin up the entire platform using a single command line. So as long as the Kubernetes layer is there and we don't care what your flavor of Kubernetes looks like, long as there's a Kubernetes layer, we can spin up the platform within a single command line. We're streaming first, uh, and that makes the data conversion on the fly within the stream as part of the platform. So 
uh, whether it's streaming, whether it's enriching the trend, uh, enriching the data as well as transforming the data, all of that happens within the stream so that we're able to take the data and uh, not only do stream ingestion, stream transformation, but also make that data available to a UI, like a common operating picture in the least amount of time necessary. And the way we make data available to those sort of uh, UIs is you pick your uh, data format, whether it's JSON, XML, Avro, and we'll, we'll give you the data in the format that you desire. And we provide the tooling, uh, which, needed, which is needed for data analysts. Uh, so some data analysts might prefer JupyterHub, some might prefer SQL APIs. Our um, job as a data platform is to give performant tools to data analysts to be able to make decisions that are needed at the, uh, at the mission that they're working on. So this is a high level architecture. Uh, I know some of this might be hard to see, but we wanted to show the entire architecture of what Raft Data Platform is capable of uh, providing. But at the core of it, what Raft Data Platform enables is making better decisions quicker that are, that are more precise at the speed that the mission requires, right? So this shows the overarching platform, but we're gonna focus on as part of this talk on Delta Lake and Trino piece. Uh, what makes Query Federation also hard with the DoD is the different classification levels. So on the right here, you'll see that we have different echelons, and those are considered classifications. Those are different environments that don't talk to each other, but they do need to be able to see data from uh, each other to be able to make uh, better informed decisions. So that data has to be tagged well to be able to make the data, make the queries uh, queryable across classifications. Um, there are parsers that we've written. So I talked about previously about uh, having data silos within SharePoint and Confluence. We've written parsers that automatically uh, uh, see which uh, files are changed and bring those changes within an S3 bucket. Uh, and from there, we bring that data into Delta Lake. Uh, for S3, we use either Minio or, uh, or Azure Blob Storage or your object storage. It doesn't matter. We support all of those three. Uh, also, on the left, you'll see that we support both streaming and batch. So there's some data that's going to be streaming, as I talked about, that being able to do uh, uh, streaming enrichments within real time, but then also having the ability to be able to take unstructured data like video files and, and CSV files to be able to do data transformation on them in real time. But as part of this talk, we'll be focusing on Trino and the Delta Lake layer. Um, last thing I'll touch on here is the platform. Uh, although Lakehouse architecture uh, provides the bronze, silver, and gold layer, um, we, uh, uh, we've taken that approach beyond that uh, at level of being able to provide hot, warm, and cold data. So as a platform level, hot data is your streaming data that we guarantee that we can provide to you within two millisecond latency, and then warm and cold have other SLAs that are tied to it and have different uh, data needs that might not be as real time as the hot data. And with that, I'll pass it over to Edward to talk, uh, take us into details of Trino and how we're using Trino with OPA today. Awesome, thanks, Brian. Yeah, so I'm gonna go through specifically uh, access control at the Trino layer for query federation uh, over a variety of different data sources, right? So uh, as Bharat mentioned, we support a variety of different backing data stores in the Raft data platform. So we've got Minio for object storage, uh, Kafka for streaming, or an RDS or an RDBMS uh, solution for relational data. Really, the central problem is how do you not only provide access in a unified manner to a variety of different data users, but also um, lock that down and ideally have a single layer of access control over the entire stack. So with that, I'm going to first go into what Trino provides for the Raft data platform, because we use it as our front end layer for these sort of large queries. Right, so obviously, as everybody knows, you know, Trino is built for these distributed queries, these huge data sets. It is really one of the industry standard tools for querying large amounts of data. And one of the main advantages that we get 
from using Trino is that, as I mentioned before, we have different backing stores, but Trino federates all of those queries. So at the same you know, place that you can query you know, an S3 you know, Parquet file, you can also query data stored in a Kafka topic. And that's been really powerful for us at Raft because it means that we only have to write you know, one certain plugin or one certain interface layer on top of that. Uh, and also means that there are sort of fewer vectors to secure. You know, one of the sort of lessons that we've learned working with the lake house architecture is that there's this balance that you have where you offer the most convenient ways for users to access data, right? So if they need it in a streaming fashion directly through Kafka or a REST API or a WebSocket, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to be able to access the data. But at the same time, that increases your attack space, your attack surface. So what Trino sort of offers us is the ability to give that easy SQL Alchemy JDBC or Trino Python library connection to the data, but also gives us the peace of mind knowing that at the end of the day, there's just a single place that we have to um, sort of secure lockdown. So um, another sort of great thing about Trino is that it's open source. We all love that. Um, Raft is, is definitely a fan of open source technology and the community behind Trino has been really helpful and really supportive um, as I'll talk a little bit more later. So that's really what we're getting from Trino, what Trino is bringing into the data platform. One of the sort of add-ons abilities on top of that, that you know, Raft's data platform wants to do is access control. Right. And so we looked at, you know, many different kinds of access control methods and paradigms for RBAC and ABAC. Um, as we went through that list and looked at the state of the open source, OPA, Open Policy Agent, very quickly rose to the top of our list. Right. So why? Why is Open Policy Agent the solution that we chose? And this is all informed by a lot of the, the lessons that we've learned dealing with lake houses, you know, over the past, you know, however many years. Um, really, OPA has three, in my mind, three big advantages, right? So first off, it's a declarative way to specify your access control, right? It's policy as code. You write out your access control paradigm, whether it's, you know, you know, in something like Rego, which is the language that OPA uses, or something like YAML for configuration, you have it ideally in a single place. And it means that, you know, you get that audit capability. There's, you know, usually a single way that you would interpret them, especially if you have that automation built in, because, you know, machines are generally more deterministic than humans are. Um, and that helps to give, you know, your security managers a lot more confidence. Um, that what they've actually specified is going to, you know, get put into place. And that also means there's less asking around to see how something gets done or how access gets granted. It's a much simpler process overall than if you use something, you know, based on a UI, based on clicking these 10 buttons in this, you know, specific order. Um, and it also integrates with these proven tools, you know, so we've actually found integration with Git really helpful, our source control management tool, right? Because you get everything that Git is built on top of. And, you know, a lot of access control uh, methods and workflows are not, you know, they're, they're really helped by something like Git, where you have this distributed, you know, sort of log of everything that's happened. You can see exactly who added what changes. You can secure your commits with, um, you know, with keys and all that. So it really integrates well into the ecosystem. Um, and so that's why we chose OPA. You know, Open Policy Agent does a lot of what we need. Um, and so now the question is, how do you merge those two together? How do you provide RBAC and ABAC through OPA and also have that, that sort of front-facing query endpoint in Trino? Um, and so the first thing that we looked at was the open source, the state of the open source, what's going on in the community right now. So there were three big things that we saw. And the first was uh, Stackable Text uh, OPA authorizer. So it's an actual plugin, a third party plugin into Trino, uh, provides sort of catalog schema access authorization based on a call out to OPA and also, you know, whether a user can execute a query or not. So that action level authorization. 
Um, recently, uh, Bloomberg has added some sort of in-progress support into Trino, so we're really excited to see you know that that first-class support in Trino itself. Um, another option that we looked at was Apache Ranger, which is you know very relatively well known in the access control space. It's proven in production. It's used in a lot of places. Um, we ended up going against Apache Ranger for a couple of different reasons. Um, OPA was significantly easier to use and cloud native, right? So OPA has, you know, very first class support for deploying in Kubernetes. It has first class support for things like a service mesh architecture where you push your policies and your rules engines out to the actual workloads, um, which Apache Ranger doesn't necessarily have. And it's also somewhat tied into the Hadoop ecosystem. So you kind of have to either commit into Hadoop or pull the parts of Apache Ranger that you want out. Um, so we determined, you know, let's let's try and make these two work together and actually, you know, write a plugin for Trino. Um, so here's a diagram of the solution. Apologies if it's a little small to read. Um, I'm just going to run through it. It's the sort of functional flow, the user flow. It's not super complex, but essentially um, users log in to the Raft data platform. We use Keycloak for IAM, but any OIDC provider uh, you could think about. We log in, we access Apache superset with SSO because everything is integrated with SSO. And using superset, you know, through making a chart or a SQL editor. So Apache superset's kind of the visualization layer in the web browser. Uh, submit a query. Superset takes that and then sends that over to Trino. The Trino cluster retrieves the raw data from, you know, in this example, Apache Kafka, could be S3, could be uh, Postgres, something else. Uh, it also passes the JOT and the data set information from Trino to OPA. OPA processes that and then returns a sort of complex uh, object. So it's not just access or deny, it's an access control scheme. Trino does, you know, the Trino plugin then does that. Um, that, that processing and then sends those filtered results back. So Trino really is the front end of the access control there. Nothing gets out of Trino that's not been passed through the access control paradigm um, and to users, they're just you know submitting queries to a single endpoint. So that's the general overview of the diagram. I'll go through a, a demo in a little bit that'll kind of illustrate it uh, at a little bit of a lower uh, level of detail. So next, um, I just wanted to dive a little bit into how we think about access control, right? So I had mentioned earlier the stackable um, Trino OPA authorizer plugin. Um, and you know, while it provides uh, that, that Trino OPA integration, there is some more fine-grained access control that we've identified in discussions with our customers and our partners that are sort of beyond the state of the open source right now. So obviously, you know, you've got your four basic types of fine-grained access control. So on a given table, I can restrict access entirely. I can remove a specific message. I can mask a column or obfuscate a column, or I can just remove the column entirely. Even within that, there's maybe even a little bit more distinction, whether I show that I've removed a message or a column or not, um, sort of the known unknown, unknown unknown kind of dichotomy. Um, so those are the basic types. We were actually a little bit surprised because there were even you know, more um, access control mechanisms that, that customers sort of talked about. So what if two users have access but in a, an environment where all the bandwidth is used up, you know, who gets their data more quickly? So prioritization, right? That's a common access control uh, question. Um, and then also the transitivity of access control. So if I've got separate nodes, if we're implementing a data mesh or a data fabric, um, how do I replicate data between those nodes while respecting access control, right? Do I replicate each individual set of, of RBAC policies? Do I replicate data and sort of filter it before sending it over? So they're more complicated access control paradigms. Um, and we've certainly not solved all of these. Um, specifically, those last two are pretty difficult. But each of these can be enabled by integrating Trino with OPA and sort of merging those two, as I talked about um, in the last diagram. 
And OPA um, also yeah. acts as our, you know, the central, what we, why we chose OPA also is it, it acts as our central policy decision point and policy enforcement point. So all the rules are within the rego, which is inside, pol inside OPA, and that's, OPA is also the one enforcing those rules. So we don't have to pick two different solutions for our PEP and PDP solutions. Yep, that's a good point. Just making it as easy as possible, as simple as possible. Um, that's definitely a win there. Um, so this, you know, sort of last slide before I move over to the demo talks about just the questions that the data users ask, right? So if I am somebody who's looking for data on the Raft data platform, I want to know what I have access to, what I can get, and how quickly I can get those data sets. Everything beyond that is sort of a second level. Those are the first questions. Um, and a lot of those questions come from the actual data users, whether those are uh, data scientists, data analysts, engineers, et cetera. In addition, our data stewards ask some more detailed questions, right? Who are the super users? What is a super user even? What, you know, what is the highest level of data access and who has access to that? How do I restrict what, it, what a user can have access to? And also what they can see they don't have access to, right? So there's that sort of further breakdown there. And then how can I set and update the priorities for data sets or for users, right? So it's more detailed um, access control. So with that being said, I'm going to move over uh, into a demo. So I'm going to stop sharing and I will share my other screen. All right, so I am in the data fabric or the Raft data platform. Um, I'm into Superset right now. So Superset is the front end. It's connected to Trino in the back end. So it's just a really easy way to, in a web browser, actually see uh, what's going on, right? It's a really easy entry point. You can also make visualizations and all that, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. Um, so as you can see on the left-hand side, connected to Trino, um, which is in turn reading from Kafka. So it's reading out of the Kafka catalog. We are uh, ingesting data in this particular pipeline, um, reading it in from an input source in JSON, translating that into Avro, storing that into Kafka, registering with the schema registry. So very typical ingest pipeline for any sort of Kafka streaming data. Um, and this specific uh, streaming data that we're looking at Right, it's sample sort of for demo data, but it's off of uh, Inmarsat. So that's a satellite communications provider. So this is satellite data. So it's, you know, things up in the air, moving around. So kind of a fun data set to look at. But, you know, really the, the easy thing to look at is, you know, give me everything in the topic. So I just want to do a select star and I can sort of see you know, what the data looks like. It's translated into SQL, which is really nice, something that Trino provides really, really well, all right? So you can see we've got all of our columns. You can see the originator here. The object name is actually what we're going to be looking at. And so if I look at um, distinct object name, so I'm actually going to just see what object names are in the data set. You can see I'm going to get three. So there's three satellites we're tracking here. Um, that's very important. So just keep that in mind. So the next thing I'm going to do is in a separate session, I'm going to log in to a different user. I'm also going to go into the um, superset front end, access the same data set, and I'm going to select my distinct object name. What we'll see here is that we're only getting a single object name. Right, so we're not actually getting all of the data. So this here is row level access control. So this actually removes rows from what's sent back based on what users being passed in. What we can also see here is that this originator column is, is set to redacted here. So it's not removed from the schema entirely, but it is set to a hard coded value uh, based on your access control, right? So we can kind of see in real time, side by side, two different users execute the same exact query and they get different data back, right? There's access control. So with that being said, what I'm gonna do now, 
Um, let's move over into the OPA policies, the roles that we have to find. So this is the policy as code, right? This is the central point for our PEP, PDP. Um, we have written our OPA Trino plugin, um, and it sort of reads these specific uh, JSON um, policies uh, in the OPA container. And it actually translates whenever you get the JOT and the data set information from Trino, it actually runs that, returns the result. The Trino plugin parses that result in a known format and then returns that uh, data set appropriately down selected, right? So this is the front end point. So you can see we have a set of roles here with permissions. Right now, we just have two um, general permission sets for this demo. We've got admin, which is what you saw on the left. And we then break it down into excluding entire catalogs out of Trino, columns, uh, schemas, uh, actual tables, and then rows, and then masking, right? So you've got sort of a, a different line of access control for each. Guest is what I logged into on the second, on the right-hand side. So first off, it's going to exclude any system catalogs. Um, it's going to exclude information schema, right? So if you're looking at relational data there, it's going to exclude tables. Um, and then also, importantly down here, it's going to filter rows and mass columns, right? So we have a simple SQL expression that says object name, if it's equal to nmarsat, 2f1, keep that. But every, everything else I'm going to throw out. And that's why we saw we got a fewer rows back as well. You also have redacting that uh, originator column, right? So it's really easy and it's also, you know, it's human readable, it's plain text format. So you can very easily imagine writing any sort of visualization layer over top of this or just looking at the JSON directly to determine what's going on and where, right? So this is the central point for you know, access control in the Raft data platform for specifically for Trino in this case, but also we can expand that out because OPA is kind of a, a generic or generified RBAC and ABAC solution. So you can imagine making this more generic for other things. Um, things I didn't show here, right? Excluding catalog catalogs or, or um, uh, schemas or tables, right? So that sort of upper level of access control. We didn't show that here because you know it's sort of sort of taken to be the default. Um, sort of the next steps that we could think about you know going on uh, in terms of adding additional features into our OPA Trino plugin access control sort of method here um, would be as I talked about before, adding prioritization, right? So having your access control be more than just a deny or allow, actually having a prioritization applied to it to where your you know, whether that's Trino or whatever you're using to communicate the data back out, um, respects a priority and, and communicates some users' data before others just so in really high, uh, critically important you know, situations, the right data gets to the right people uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so this is all, as I said before, deployed um, as part of Trino. We just build a uh, Trino Docker with our custom jars loaded into it and then deploy that, you know, as you would any normal Trino container. Um, our OPA container is, you know, pretty much open source with our added Rego, which I'm not showing here because it's a little bit behind the scenes um, to actually uh, figure out how to take these um, JSON configurations and actually apply them, right? So if you've ever seen Rego, you know you've got this sort of almost looks like JSON format programming language. Uh, it's really cool behind the scenes uh, in how it evaluates sort of access control paths, but uh, we've done a lot of work to actually um, add that in so that OPA knows how to deal with these access controls as they come in. Um, and so with that, I think I will stop and see if we have any questions. But uh, if not, thank you so much for uh, for hearing us talk today. Thank you.